Welcome everybody. This will be our first remote learning experience and this is the first time I've ever done anything like this so be patient with me and uh, I guess forgive the quality of the recording. We'll do the best I can. Um, I'm going to plan to do a video like this at least once a week if not twice a week and you'll get an announcement that will tell you what to do. In this case, you should already have gotten an announcement about some reading that has been posted under the Files link on Canvas. If you go to the Files link, you should find a Word document titled, I believe, Caricature. And if you go there, read that first. It has a lot of examples. Hopefully, that will inspire you. Uh, and there's also an assignment at the end of that reading uh, that will be due on Monday, March 23rd. Now when I say due, since we're doing remote learning, that means you'll do the drawing that I ask you to do, take a photograph of it with your phone, and then email it to me by the time that I ask. Um, just try to keep things squared away and try to stay on deadline. That way it'll make things easier for both of us. Um, so what I want to show you how to do today, and I have an assistant, my friend Mike, Hello. was willing to sit for me for this. Um, we just finished up a pretty rigorous chapter of our learning uh, when we did the, the sort of micro drawings where we were doing small groupings of objects as still life, and then we worked in value, always working with the elements and principles of design. So far we've focused on line, shape, value, form, texture, and space. Um, all really important parts of art and drawing in particular. Um, but before we jump into something else, we're going from the micro to the macro, meaning we're going to go to perspective, something much larger, I like to fit in this sort of interim project, something in between these rigorous units to give us a little breathing room, to give you a chance to sort of relax, do something fun, take your mind off of all this really controlled uh, technical stuff we're doing, and do something a little bit more easygoing. Now I have a lot of experience in the way of drawing caricature. I've been doing it for over 20 years. I did it in amusement parks from the time I was 15, and then I've done it on my own for quite some time. And I have my methods for doing it, just as other artists do. A lot of that information is included in the reading, so if you haven't already done it, go back, read that stuff, and then come back and watch the video. Because this is the, the more uh, direct tutorial about how to go about doing this, that's just going to fill you in on the information that you need to know before you start. Okay, so if you haven't, stop the video, go back, do the reading, then come back and watch the video. Okay? So when it comes to caricature, which generally what you're doing is you're exaggerating somebody's face, you're turning them into a cartoon. Um, I approach it in such a way as to make it not inflammatory so that it doesn't uh, insult the person that I'm drawing. Now, the reason that I do that, because I was trained in an amusement park, and you don't want to do a drawing of someone and have them be like, oh, it doesn't look like me, you made my nose too big, you made my hair look crazy, you made me look too old, and then they'll turn you down. The idea at amusement parks is you're trying to push out as many of these as you can, and you don't want anybody to turn you down. You want everybody to be happy with the drawing you give them, and you probably want them to laugh a little bit. So what I do is more along the lines of cartoony portraiture. I would say caricatures are a little bit more exaggerated. Um, so in this case, I'm going to do a cartoony portrait of my friend Mike here. Now, since Mike's a good sport, I could probably exaggerate him a little bit, which I intend to do. So to start, I'm going to use a pencil, just like the ones that you have, good old number two, and I'm going to sketch him first. Now, caricature artists don't always do that. In fact, I was trained not to do that. I was trained to jump in directly with one of these. Well, not necessarily a Sharpie, but a drawing marker. I use Sharpies now because they're ubiquitous. You can find them anywhere. You can go into a grocery store, you can go into Walmart, you can find them. Uh, so it's easy for me, and they're relatively cheap. I'll be jumping to this after I do the sketch. And I want to reinforce the importance of drafting to you, which we just spent a lot of time doing. A good draft equals a better drawing. So drafting isn't a bad thing, especially since I'm not under the kind, the kind of time constraints that I would be under if I were working at an amusement park. Oh, do as many as you can. Do them in like three to five minutes. I don't need to do that anymore. I'm past that point. I've been doing it a long enough time that now I do it on my own terms. My terms are I want the person to get the best drawing that I can give them in a reasonable amount of time. So I'm going to sketch first. Then I'm going to jump to the marker. So wow. we have another friend here. Hey, come here, buddy. Come here. Xavier, come here. 
come here. I saw a meme the other day that said, all these professors who have to do remote learning now, their cats are going to become low-key famous. Hey, buddy. There's a couple cats that might walk back and forth here, but we'll do our best to keep the, uh, the screen free so that you can see the drawing surface while I'm doing this. And I'm using Mike as my reference, and here's where I'm going to start. The same way we did whenever we were doing the drawings of the, the objects, we were breaking them down into simple shapes. It works the same way with everything, including faces. Mike's face, as I look at it, is pretty ovular. So I'm going to start off with my pencil. Look how I'm holding it, just like the magic wand, swish and flick. I'm down low so I can see what I'm drawing, remaining loose, drawing with my whole arm. Once I want to get a little bit more detail-oriented, I'll choke up a little bit. But for now, I'm going to stay loose. And I'm going to draw the oval that I see as being Mike's head. And I'm going to try to place it pretty close to the center of the page. And I'm using a lot of the page. I'm using, like, almost half of it because the face is the focus. I want to fill as much of the, uh, the page as I can. I don't want to draw it all small in the middle. Use that space effectively. And now that I have the oval, I'm going to put in these basic guidelines. Okay? I've got one going horizontal, one going vertical, and what these are going to tell me is where to place my features, which we'll get to in just a second. I've got this oval, but I also want to look at Mike's face and say, okay, is it really an oval? It kind of is, but it's more, it's wider, I guess, at the jawline than it is at the top. So I'm going to go back over my oval and just kind of bring out the bottom a little bit. Change the shape of it just slightly so that I have a little bit more accurate of a shape for his head. So now that I've got that, I want to look at the shape of his hair. Now, I'm not going to go in there and draw every little hair. I'm going to draw it as a large representative mass. And his hair is pretty crazy. As you can see, it's Christmas morning. He just woke up. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to draw his hair as like this large, kind of crazy shape coming out. And I, this is something I could definitely exaggerate because it'll make it look funnier. So I've got that in place. Now, when we do a caricature, it's not just the face, it's the bust. So we come down to where the neck is, and I'm going to put necklines in here. Now, obviously his neck isn't going to be as skinny as I'm going to draw it here. It comes out either side of his jawline, but it's a cartoon. So it's okay to exaggerate, and skinny necks make things look funny. So I'm going to do the skinny neck and the shoulders like so. You see how loose I sketched that in it. I mean, you, can, you can see most of this. It's not too lightly drawn that you can't see it. I'm going to end up erasing all these pencil lines afterwards. So now that I've got that placed, I can come up here and look at Mike's features. Now this line indicates to me where his eyes will be. This guideline that's actually used to bisect the shape of his head. So I'm just going to draw in basic ovals, leaving about one oval's width in between, and about a half to an oval's width to either side of his temple. Okay? Then I've got to come down and figure out where's his nose going to be. Probably right about here. And I'm just going to put a circle in there for the indication of the nose. And Mike's got facial hair, which makes my job a little bit easier. It means I can turn those shapes into things that cover some of the other features. But they're important shapes because they're indicative of what Mike actually looks like. I can put in the indication of his lower lip, more facial hair here, slight facial hair on his chin, and then down here where his beard comes in, I'm just putting in the shape of the beard real loosely. Okay? So now that I've got all of that placed, the one other thing that I need to add to Mike are his glasses. They're square, and I'm going to actually exaggerate those and make them bigger than they are. They're going to extend past the edges of his head, even though it doesn't actually do that. Uh, I'm exaggerating, doing a caricature here. And the sides of his glasses rest on his ears so I can put those in. Now, I've got Mike sketched pretty well. I'm just putting in a couple little details here, indication of the eyebrows, so he's sketched. Now I can go back on top of this with my Sharpie marker and ink it, bring out all the lines, make it look like him. Now, the reason we use marker, it's bold. It means everything will show up. It'll look like a cartoon because it's a lot of simple line work. And the nice thing about Sharpies, in particular the fine point, which you can see the tip of this. There's Xavier. He wanted to be famous. It's better than the very fine point. This one's too small. This is the kind of thing you use to do 
what we were doing when we were um, creating value by way of mark making and a lot of lines cross hatching hatching this is for developing line weight so if there's an area of Mike's face that I draw a little bit heavier that's indicating that there's some type of shadow there if it's a thinner line then there's light there that's all we're doing with this we're making a transition between thin and thick lines in order to make something look better so I'm going to go back on top of this and I'm going to start off at the top and work my way into the center. I'm creating a frame for my face and I'm working my way towards the middle. So I'm going to start off with Mike's hair. You see how this doing like jagged marks, jagged lines indicating his hair the whole way around where it comes back in towards his head. I'm going to come in here get some of these marks. Look how loosely I'm doing this. Some of my lines are broken. That's okay. It's a cartoon. It doesn't need to be precise. In fact, it's better if it's loose. It kind of has this like fresh quality to it. It makes it look lively and fun. So don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid to experiment with this. Try to be loose with it. Okay? And I'm not putting tons of lines in here. Like I said, I'm not rendering every single hair. I'm just looking at the direction that some of his hairs are going and putting them in there. On the side here and where his temple is. Now here is the top of Mike's head. And you know the head rolls back into space so there's going to be a line here to indicate a separation plane. So I put that here to show where the temple is. Now I'm going to come down here to his jawline and frame the face. And I'm going to do that by way of the hair that's on his face here. And see how loosely and sort of haphazardly I'm rendering in these hairs all the way around his jawline. And I may want to come in here and get darker in some areas. Namely down here, the bottom of his beard, where there's not going to be as much light hitting his face. Okay? So I've got that, and I'm going to come back inside and render that hair a little bit further down to where I see his beard meeting with his chin. I'm doing that on both sides. And when we draw portraits, it's a good rule of thumb to work across the face. You don't want to do one side and then go do the other. I'm going to do feature to feature across the face. Otherwise, the face gets wonky and it starts to look more like a Picasso and less like a caricature. So now that I've got his face framed, I am going to finish off the bottom portion, the bust, putting in that skinny neckline. And I indicate that there's a shadow being cast by his chin on his neck by just kind of chopping a section out of there and filling it in real dark. See that? And then I can put in the color of his shirt, maybe some folds in his shirt, and then I'm going to put in his hoodie and his shoulders. Now if I wanted to, I could take my Sharpie and kind of fill in some of this area since his hoodie is very dark. This will help to separate it a little bit from the rest of the form. Even the shoulders could maybe be a little heavier. There we go, we've got a bust in there now. So now that I've got the face framed and the bust is done, it's time to jump up here and worry about the features. First thing I want to do is come up and just put in the indication of Mike's ears on either side. And I'm doing this a series of simple lines. There's a lot of different ways you can draw ears, too. I'm just drawing them as I see them, as these sort of flat, but also um, curved shapes that are jutting out from either side of his cheeks. And I'm working across so I can kind of compare where his earlobes are, where the tops of his ears are, so it's relatively symmetrical. People are not symmetrical, though. People's faces are not necessarily perfectly symmetrical, but it's a good place to start. From there, we can make adjustments. Okay, so now I'm going to come up here, just as we started with the hair and work down at the bottom, I'm going to start feature-wise with his eyebrows and work my way towards the interior of the face. Mike's eyebrows aren't super thick, so I can kind of put in the indication of where they are. And then what I'm going to do is use those mark-making techniques we've used before, in this case, hatch marks, and I'm going to move his eyebrows away from the center line of his face. 
And I'm doing that on both sides, working my way across. Now I'm going to look at the distance between his eyebrows. He's got a couple of these concentration marks there above the bridge of his nose. So I made a point to just put those in real quickly, real sharp, simple marks. Now I'm going to look at Mike's nose. His nose is made up of several different shapes. The bridge of his nose is where I'm going to start. It starts up here, comes down on both sides. The ball of his nose isn't very pronounced. It's, you know, kind of small. So I'm just going to come down here and get the ball of his nose first. There's some broken lines there. I didn't put a lot of heavy lines here yet. And then from here I can figure out where to put his nostrils, which I do see them. They aren't really super pronounced, but I see just enough of them to put them in there and indicate the bottom of the nose. And I'm using a heavier line there because there's shadow there. I just cast the shadow. Either side of the nostrils as such, and now I can decide if I want to say maybe this side of his face is more in shadow, so maybe that side of his nose has a slightly darker line on it. So now I'm going to come down below his nose, and I'm going to put in just a couple of marks here to indicate where his cheeks are, and it will also give me a frame of reference for where to place his facial hair. So his mustache, I'm going to come down and get this little curve he's got here. I'm going to actually pronounce that a little further than it actually is for the purpose of caricature and exaggeration. And then I'm going to do it on the other side as well. Remember drawing across the form so that things are sympathetic. I want them to all work together. So that looks pretty much how I like it to. Bottom lips in there, and I'm doing a heavy line for that. Again, bottom lips casting a shadow underneath. Okay, It's like a little ledge. No light's hitting it unless it would be coming from underneath. Light's coming from up here, shadow's underneath. Same with the nose. And now I can get hair underneath his bottom lip, coming down and connecting with his beard. And at this point, maybe I want to add a few more stray hairs here and there to make it look fuzzy. And there we go. We've got the mustache, we've got the beard. It's up to you how much value you want to add, how far you want to take that. So now we've got to come back up here and worry about Mike's eyes. Now, I'm filling in the areas where his sideburns are now. I left those open because I'm going to put the lines for his glasses on there. But I need them so I can tell where the edge of my face is and where to put Mike's eyes. The line on top, right here, the upper lid, is the heavy one. Again, same principle as the shadow under the nose, shadow under the bottom lip, shadow underneath the chin. We're using these to indicate light source and we're varying our line weight to create visual contrast, separation in planes, separation in features. So I've got that heavy upper lid, and now I'm going to just put in a broken line to the bottom, like so, and Mike and I are old guys now, so he won't feel so bad if I put some extra lines on his face, like there and there, to indicate his age. And now, since I've got the shape of the eyes in there, I can put in these half circles. And then inside of those half circles, I'm going to put another smaller circle. And I'm just going to fill in this area. It's very dark. Now, if the person has blue eyes, you might want to add in a little extra space for the iris. But otherwise, uh, you can just keep it very dark. I'm going to make his... The little dots of highlight in his eyes, these are those hot spots we talked about. The little dots of highlight in his eyes, I made sure to put those there. Even if you can't really see them, they're important for adding life to the face. So don't neglect those little areas of white inside the eyes. And now I can put Mike's glasses on top of this. And I'm just going to draw them heavy. He's got these heavy black frames. I'm going to put the part that goes above the nose in first. And then just kind of following my guidelines. And drawing across, always trying to match things up as best I can. And then I can come back in here and put in those heavy frames by turning my marker on its side. And going real heavy. Get those thick frames and indicate the glasses. Okay? And just 
whole way around. And then I can get in here and put those next to put the situate the glasses on top of his ears. And I always do some of these lines, reflective lines to show that there's lenses on there. So you saw me do all of this. I got to the point where I was putting some reflective lines on the glasses there. Uh, and that was it. That was sort of the finishing touch. Now I might look at it and see if there's anything else I want to add, any line weight I wanted to beef up, but for the most part I'm pretty happy with it. So if I like it, I can put my signature on there and it's all done. So that's how you could draw somebody in the method that I prescribe using a Sharpie marker and good old-fashioned drawing pencil. Now at this point I would probably grab my plastic eraser. I would use this as opposed to the needed just because it's a little bit more abrasive uh, and I can bring these lines up real quick. There's still pencil lines all over this that I want to clean up. I'm just going to real quickly go over this whole thing and erase all those sketchy pencil lines I put on there so that it's a nice, clean, finished draw. Have I ever drawn a caricature of you before? When I was in... Great. Right. Four Ligonier like days. Well, then it's been, a, yeah, it's been a long time. Five years. You've got a lot more facial hair than you did. <laughs> yes. Um, but there you go. That's my caricature of my pal Mike here. Uh, and doing a picture of an adult is very different than doing a picture of a child. Of course, drumming uh, a man as opposed to a woman is different depending upon the person's, person's ethnicity. Their hair, their facial features will be very different. You just got to practice. Um, I'm not expecting any of you to become full-fledged caricature artists, but if it's something you're interested in, those are the things that I would say to pay attention to in terms of people's facial features and their hair and everything. Draw people that are diverse. Draw a lot of different uh, shapes and sizes, different people, uh, and you'll get a better idea of really how to draw just about anything. In fact, in the 20 plus years I've been doing this, I would say I've learned more from drawing caricature than I have from drawing most other things. And it's because it's a simplified version of everything. It's an exaggerated, simplified version. Um, so that would be my prescription to you if you want to become better at drawing other things. Draw them as cartoons first, then jump to drawing them in a way that is maybe a little bit more realistic. Um, so that's what I've got for you today. Uh, I'm going to actually have one more person sit for me shortly here. I just wanted to do this demo for you first, so give me a few minutes, I'll recapitulate, and we'll do one more demo, and then you can do your own. Okay? Hey, we're back. We're going to do one more caricature with my friend, Bryn. This is Mike's daughter. Uh, how old are you, Bryn? I'm 10. She's 10. Good, good age to be. Uh, I know Bryn's face pretty well because uh, I sit across from her when we play Dungeons and Dragons on the weekends. Um, and I was thinking what I would do with her caricature is instead of just doing her face, I'm actually going to draw her caricature her character from Dungeons and Dragons, so that'll be fun for her to have. And uh, I'm actually going to add some color to this one too. So this one will take maybe a little bit longer than the last one, uh, but this, it's still the same process. It's still the same step-by-step -step set of uh, things that we did the last time, and you're going to see that. The difference being, she's a young child. So her features are going to be different proportionally. Uh, the way I started off her dad, I drew his face as an oval. In Bryn's case, I'm going to draw her face as more of a circle. And I'm moving it up a little bit. I'm giving myself some space at the bottom because I'm going to actually add a body and some other stuff to this later. Um, so I've got this circle for her head. And now I'm looking at the shape of her face. And I'm seeing that, proportionally speaking, the top part of her head is slightly larger than the bottom part. So I'm sort of doing this like Tweety Bird thing where I'm like making the top part of her head a little bit bigger and a little more exaggerated and the bottom part of it, it's going to taper a little bit. And it's going to add uh, the effect of making her look younger, um, a little bit more cartoony because kids tend to be a little bit more cartoony because proportionally their heads are bigger uh, in respect to the rest of their body until they grow into them. So I've got that basic shape on there and I'm doing the same thing I did before, putting in my guidelines. But I'm actually going to put this horizontal guideline in a little bit lower, giving a little bit extra space towards the top of the head. Same thing I did before, adding in the necklines, but this time I'm going to leave the rest of this blank so that I can add 
uh, a body to it in a little bit. So I've got the head placed. And now I'm going to start off again like I did before, in this case with Bren's hair. The top of her hair, there's a part right in the middle. And I'm going to just draw the curves to either side where her hair is. And she's got these sort of like curly, wavy parts of her hair that hang down to either side. And then her hair kind of poofs out either side. And it's very curly and thick. So I got that on there now too. And I'm leaving the bottom of this empty so that I can draw that in later once I figure out where I want to place her body. Okay, so now I can use these guidelines to indicate her features. Same thing as before, putting in her eyebrows, very slightly. And then her nose, and I'm looking at the bridge of her nose. It curves in pretty extremely towards where her different noses and her glasses are. And then it comes down. And the ball of her nose is actually kind of heart-shaped. I see that now, and I'm going to put that in almost like a heart shape. And nostrils to either side. Lose the render. And I'm putting that little crease underneath the nose, above the lip. I'm putting that in there, too, because hers is pretty pronounced. And I'm just going to put in the indication of her mouth right here with a slightly upturned smile where her cheek is on this side. Kind of makes it look funny when half the mouth is kind of smiles like a smirk. Uh, I think that'll add to the image of her character. Her chin's very round, so I'm going to draw that circle shape there to indicate where her chin is, and then I can come up and get her eyes. And in this case, her eyes are larger proportionally to her face than the ones I drew on her dad's face. They were a little bit small. I'm going to make her eyes pretty big. In fact, and don't quote me on this because I'm not a scientist, but I have read that your eyes are one of the only features on your body that don't grow much over time. They tend to stay about the same size. So since her head is smaller than it will be when she's fully grown, her eyes are larger in proportion to the rest of her head. Then I can put in circles for the eyes and her glasses, which are kind of angular. They're, they're square, but they're a little bit angled. And I'm going to make those real big. Again, doing this to make it look funny. They aren't actually that big, but we're in the business of exaggeration. And her hair kind of covers over her ears, but I want to indicate that her ears are there. So I'm just going to put the slightest indication of her ears through her hair. Okay? So your Dungeons & Dragons character is a druid, correct? So she would wear maybe some type of robe, yes? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to figure out where I want to place her body, and I'm using simple shapes to do this. I'm using like a tin can shape for the upper portion of her body, for the thorax, and then a teacup shape for the bottom part, and then just some sticks and balls. Balls are for the joints, sticks are for the appendages, have them come out, elongated for the feet. I'm going to have one arm come out, and you have a staff, don't you? Yes. Okay. So I'm putting a ball at the joint here, one at the elbow joint, hand comes out, and then I can put in some type of staff here. Okay, there's the, the basic idea of where it would be. And then the other arm, remember you recently got, what was the, what was the character's name? It was in the seed pod. It's like an ant or something? Like a tree ant. Yeah. So I'm going to put that under your arm. because She actually got this little hatchling creature recently. It's like a baby tree inside of a seed pod. So I'm going to end up putting that underneath your arm. And since you've got a robe on, I'm going to put the hood behind. Have it come down. Put some like long sleeves on there. And I'm just sketching this super loosely. Because I'm going to come back and add in all the details later. And now that I know where that stuff is, I can put in the ends of her hair and make it super long, funny, and like really exaggerated like that. Maybe I can put some trees and stuff behind her after. But for now, we're just going to focus on this part. So you're sketched. Now at this point, you can sit there and be surprised. Well, I guess you aren't surprised because you can see the computer screen and exactly what I'm doing. Or if you want to, you can actually come back and watch me ink. It's up to you. If you're better off sitting right there, that's fine. All right. You can also corral the cats if they decide to jump on the computer. Okay, so now I'm doing the same thing I did before, starting at the top and framing the face first, then working my way down into some of the other details. 
coming up here on the top of Bryn's hair. Remember, working across, doing both sides to her part first, and I'm indicating the part with some of these lines that separate the hair. See, I'm not going crazy with this. I'm not rendering every line. Fewer lines uh, equals a, a clearer picture. So just do enough, just enough to indicate things, and then from there you can decide if you need to add more. So I've got either side of her hairline in there. I've got a couple of little flyaways here. I think that's becoming of a druid because the wind likes to play in our hair. We've got the hair there coming down to where the ears are. I'm going to indicate that your hair is wavy down to where your sideburns would be. And I put in those same lines to indicate your temples. Okay. So now I can come down here and get the shape of her face. And I'm going to do this in one line. I'm going to start over here where her cheek is. and down. Curve inwards towards the chin. Remember, I drew that circle so I knew exactly where her chin was. Come back up, and I'm comparing this to the other side, just trying to get it to be relatively symmetrical. So I've got the chin line here now. And I'm going to come up here to indicate where the hair meets with either side of her face, and I maybe put in the indication of her ears. And see, I did these a little bit differently than I did Mike's ears. His were sort of flat to the side of her face, and I'm having her stick out just a little bit more. It adds to the, the youthful quality. Now I come to the outside of her hairline and start getting those wavy sides of her hair. And then I can draw in these ones that come down in front of her face a little bit, like so. Okay, so we've got those in there. And now we can come down here and add in her skinny neckline and a shadow for where her chin is. Now I'm going to come up and work on her features. I'm going to worry about this other stuff after I get her face. So I'm going to come up here and indicate her eyebrows. And I'm doing these lighter than I did Mike's because her eyebrows are not quite as thick. But always the marks are going away from the center of the face. They're just hatch marks that are lined up against each other and they're going away from the center of the face. Okay? And then between, I can see the indication of a line here for where top of her nose starts, and her nose comes down, and I'm going to come in here and work on the ball of her nose, which we said was sort of like a heart shape. I mean, broken lines kind of help piece things together. As I was saying, your eye tends to optically blend things together and connect broken lines. Um, so I just finished this off by putting in Bryn's nostrils to either side, and now if I want to, I can add in those lines to create the connection for her nose. I'm going to come down here and get that little crease that's right above her lips, below her nose, and I'm going to come in here and look for the edges of her mouth, curved line like this. It's going to come up here. Remember, I was going to draw that as a smirk, so the, the direction of the lines is very important. I curve one outward to the edge of the mouth and then one inward to show that there's a cheek there. I'm going to do it on this side as well. And then the bottom lip, as before when I was drawing Mike, make that heavier so that it looks like there's some shadow underneath it. And I can come in here and round out her chin a little bit. Maybe I need to chop a little bit off the bottom and just round that out like so. Okay, and I'm looking at the edges of her face and thinking maybe I need to add some more line weight, thicken it up a little bit just to give it a little bit more of a pronounced appearance. And now we have most of the face. The only thing we need to add at this point is the life, the eyes, and we're going to do that right now. I'm going to go in here. We're going to add in the upper lid, and I'm going to give Bryn some thick eyelashes coming off the side there. And I'm going to come back over that line, make it nice and heavy. And then here, where the eye terminates, I'm just doing these broken lines to show that it's her eyelid. We do this on the same same thing, other side, and we're always working across so that the face doesn't look too wonky. Getting those eyelashes in there, going back over the line, making it heavier, and then from here, indicating the eyelid. I'm going to come underneath here and just draw these little lines here. Again, they're broken lines, and then 
I'm going to add a few more eyelashes on the bottom, like that, curving out over the cheek. And now I can put those circles inside, like so. And I'm going to add one, two circles this time, because kids then have a bigger, more sort of like glistening eyes. They have that sort of youthful innocence in them, so putting a secondary circle in there for like another hot spot just kind of adds a little bit to it. Uh, and I'm putting in that really dark circle for the pupil, and then I can add in lines for the iris. Okay, so now I can add in Bren's glasses, which her glasses also have thick frames, just like Mike's did, but they're slightly angled. Not quite as square as his were. And over here, all the way over to the ear. Okay, so those are placed, and now I can come back on top, turn my marker on its side, and make those frames nice and thick so they look like glasses. Move that on both sides. Now, not everybody has glasses, of course, so you aren't always going to end up having to draw them. I mean, I guess that's something that both of my subjects today have in common. But it is nice to have that extra something to make it look like a person, and it's nice when someone has some type of an accessory, whether it be a hat or, you know, maybe some kind of a tattoo or a piercing or something. It always adds something to the face and makes it look that much more like the person. Okay, so... We pretty much got Bren's face figured out. Now I just have to worry about her hair and her ears. Her ears are inside her hair, so I'm going to overlap either of them with more of her hair. That looks pretty good. So now I can worry about her body. And in this case, she's a druid. D&D, uh, &D, she's got some type of a, a robe on, a magical robe for keeping all of her magical... Uh, abilities hidden inside, maybe some magical woodland creatures in there, uh, including her her ghost cat familiar, George. And then I'm just following the line work that I've already created. Now, I don't remember exactly what everything looks like, what her outfits look looks like, but I'm just going to do something kind of standard here, and then you can decide if you like it or not. I'm actually even going to put your little pendant you've got in here. I would think, as a druid, you probably have some kind of a symbolic necklace, which you've got there. I'll put that on. And I'm indicating her shoulders to either side. And then her robe comes down. I get a little flowing at the bottom. And I'm going to come out here. Add in the arms, and on this one as well, because we're coming underneath her hair to either side. Now, I'm going to put in the boots. And all these are simple shapes, simple lines, nothing too fancy. The simpler, the better. Communicate things clearly and easily. I'm going to put in a little cast shadow here underneath. So now I'm going to put her hand in here, holding her staff. And I just did those as little blocks. And your staff's just like a wooden staff, right? Does it have anything on it, like a gem or anything? Oh, that's right, it's burnt, it got lit on fire. So we'll make it look like it's a little charred here and there. That's a kind of like a knot at the top of it. There we go. And then over here, you've got your seed pod. It's kind of small, so I'm not going to get too detailed with this. I'm just going to put the indication that you're holding it. Under your arm like that. Maybe put some 
lines to indicate that it's glowing. And now that I've got that, I can come back in here and I can finish off your, your hair, make it all wavy and come all the way down. I would assume that a druid probably wouldn't cut her hair too often. So I let it go untrimmed as the trees and vines and things in nature. Maybe there are even, even some like leaves in your hair. Put some grass underneath and behind you. Not too bad. Can you see it? Look all right? Okay. So there is Bryn's character in D&D. &D. I'm going to come back in like I did last time and erase my pencil lines to clean this up. And I'm going to color a small portion of this just so you can see how I go about colorizing um, a caricature. And you can decide if you want to take it that far. It is not mandatory. Whenever you guys do your own, you add color. But color does add a little something extra. So once I got all of my pencil lines erased, I'm just going to color in Bryn's head and face. Now, what I'm going to work with here, I have these, oh, this one's worn down to almost the nubbin. This is a color stick. They come in squares. They're a Prismacolor brand. All they are is really essentially fancy crayons. They're wax. Um, so I have those, but I also have some Prismacolor pencils that I can use. Um, so it's up to you what you would want to use for that if you did decide to add color. I'm going to do a little bit of both. I've got everything pulled out here so that I can use all these. And what I'm going to do, whenever I'm coloring a caricature, and this, is, this kind of goes along with my amusement park training, is you want to do this quickly and loosely. Because every time you add another step, you're adding more time. And you want to um, work as quickly as possible and get as many done as possible. So we aren't going to actually color in the whole thing. We're just going to color in areas that we know would be darker. So I'm following some of the contours by coming underneath here, where her forehead is, where it meets with her hairline, uh, right here where her temple is. That would be darker than the front part. Uh, and see, I'm kind of lightly going over it. So it looks like there's light hitting her head. Okay. Same thing with her nose. I'm going to come here and go around the circle of the ball of her nose. It's going to be darker underneath. Either side, same thing. Nostrils, upper lip is usually in shadow. Bottom lip usually has like an area of highlights. I'm going to leave part of that open. Part underneath her nose is dark. Line of her cheeks, darker as well. Eyelids are always going to be dark because they're set inside the skull. Okay, so I filled in the area where the eyelids were because the eyes are inset into the skull, so the eyelids would be in shadow as well, so there'd be a darker area there, coming in underneath either side, underneath her eyes, pronouncing her cheeks a little bit, coming around in like a circular fashion, and then I'm going down along her jawline to either side, and then I'm going to pronounce her chin by sort of going around it in a circle, and then I'll come up here where her ears are, fill those in a little bit, and her neck. Of course, I could do her hands as well. I'm going to leave the body for uh, after I finish this part. So I've got the basic color on there. I don't know how, how easily you can see it on the screen. I mean, it looks a lot different to us than it will to you guys uh, just because of the resolution on the camera. But it's enough. It's enough to indicate color and tone. So now I'm going to jump in and color in Bryn's hair. And her hair is very dark brown. But there's always other colors uh, underneath what we see. Uh, we call those like subdermal colors, or colors that are underneath the skin, so to speak, underneath the top layer. I'm putting in this sort of golden color right underneath, blocking it in, just to add another layer of interest, something a little extra to the color of her hair. Now I can jump in with one of these Prisma colors that I have and start focusing on the color of her hair. And I'm always going to edges, edges that are separating uh, features and planes. Those are the areas where I add the most density of color. And then I can kind of come across 
like that real loosely, and it sort of fills in, again, optically mixing. You can see how much more brown this appears than this already, and I've barely gone over it. Just very loosely gone over parts of that. I'm going to do that all the way down to here. And the area that's behind her head will be darker because it is in shadow. There's no light reaching that area. Let's see. Do the same thing on this side. This would be a good time, too, if you wanted to, to add a few more lines for the hair, just kind of following the guidelines I've set for myself already. She's also got brown eyebrows. And what color are your eyes? Are they brown as well? Yeah. Okay. So I can come in, color in her eye iris is brown. And now I'm going to do some pink here. Where do I put the pink? And I'll use red. I'm going to use the red to make her, her lips a little bit uh, more red. Still going around where I had that highlight. Putting a little bit of red on her nose. Also on her cheeks. Make them look a little bit flushed. And her ears. In fact, there's a passage through the center of the face. It's like the nose, cheeks, ears, this whole section tends to appear more red because that's where all of your blood vessels are sort of concentrated. So whenever you flush it. Whenever you draw that area, it's good to come back in and add a little bit more red. I'm going to do a little bit on the chin as well. Okay, and then I'm going to come in here and add a little bit of, just for fun, a little bit of purple, purple eyeshadow. Just because I had the purple sitting there, I thought it would be fun. Uh, and then I'm going to jump to a light blue, and I'm going to go over the top of her glasses with the light blue, so it looks like there's actually uh, glasses there. So there's some color. And I would keep going with this. I would add more color to her druid outfits and green to the background. But you don't have to get crazy with it. It just has to be the indication of color. So even that grassy background could just be blocked in real quickly, and then you could maybe do a couple marks like this to indicate grass. And it's like loose and fresh and fun, and that's what cartoons are all about. So, now it's your turn. I'd like you guys to do your own caricatures. Try maybe doing a family member or a friend. You could even do one of yourself if you want to sit in front of a mirror. Uh, but the one that I want you to turn into me, uh, if you do the reading, is going to be of a famous person. The reason I want you to do a famous person is you're probably going to be more likely to exaggerate and not feel like you're going to hurt somebody's feelings if you draw that person uh, making them look really goofy and over-exaggerated. So do the reading if you hadn't already done it, and make sure that you follow uh, the guidelines for that project. Thank you, Bren, for sitting for me. And I'll see you guys, well, I won't see you, but you'll see me sometime next week when I'll do another video. This time it will be on perspective. So be well, and we'll see you later.